In the deep darkness of Antarctica, a fierce blizzard lashes against a small, frail tent. Inside, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and the remnants of his team huddle for warmth. The cold bites through their layers, and the dim light of a struggling candle casts haunting shadows on their worn faces. Supplies are low, the end feels near, and Scott, feeling trapped by the relentless storm, reflects on the series of events that led to this desperate situation. Years earlier, the desire to reach the South Pole ignited a fierce rivalry between Scott, a British naval officer and explorer, and Roald Amundsen, a seasoned Norwegian adventurer. Both were driven by a profound desire to carve their names into the history books under the title of First to the South Pole. Scott's vision was grandiose, encompassing not only the attainment of the pole, but also extensive scientific research to enhance understanding of the unknown continent. Meanwhile, Amundsen focused solely on the goal of reaching the pole. His plan was marked by straightforward simplicity and rigorous efficiency. Amundsen's team was smaller, his equipment more suited to the extreme conditions, and his approach pragmatic relying on sled dogs, which were well adapted to the polar environment. As the preparations unfolded, the contrast between the two approaches became stark. Scott's expedition was a major operation, loaded with the latest technology of the time. His ship, the Terra Nova, was filled to the brim with motor sledges, ponies, and scientific equipment. The team itself was a mixture of sailors, scientists, and adventurers, all united by the thrill of exploration and the pride of representing Britain. In contrast, Amundsen's Fram was modestly equipped but highly efficient. He handpicked his crew for their skills and experience with polar conditions. The Norwegian's gear was streamlined for survival and speed, and they practiced extensively with their sled dogs preparing for the challenges of the Antarctic ice. Both teams set sail from their respective countries amid much public excitement. Scott's departure was a national event, covered extensively by the press and followed eagerly by the British public. Amundsen's departure, in keeping with his nature, was a quieter affair, though no less determined. Upon reaching the Antarctic, the differences in preparation began to show Scott's team struggled with the harsh conditions almost from the start. The motor sledges proved unreliable in the extreme cold, and the ponies were not suited to the icy terrain, suffering greatly and slowing the expedition's progress. The reliance on technology, which seemed a strength, quickly became a liability. The team was forced to resort to man-hauling their heavy equipment, draining their energy and morale. A Munson's journey, meanwhile, was a model of polar efficiency. The sled dogs thrived in the cold, allowing the team to move quickly and set up supply depots along the route. These caches, strategically placed during the journey to the pole, ensured that the return trip would be just as swift. On December 14, 1911, Amundsen and his men reached the South Pole. They planted the Norwegian flag, achieving a straightforward victory. Amundsen's meticulous planning and respect for the harsh polar environment had paid off. His team made it back to their base without a single casualty, their route marked by a series of successful depot layovers. Scott's team reached the pole on January 17, 1912, more than a month after Amundsen. The sight of the Norwegian flag fluttering at the pole was a crushing blow. Nevertheless, they conducted their planned scientific observations before starting the treacherous journey back. This return was plagued by severe blizzards, scurvy, and the physical and mental toll of their defeat. The hardships of their return journey were immense. Edgar Evans was the first to succumb to the combined effects of frostbite, injury, and exhaustion. Later, Lawrence Oates, suffering from severe frostbite and aware that his condition was slowing the group, sacrificed himself in a bid to save his companions. He left the tent during a blizzard, walking out into the Antarctic wilderness, never to return. Scott and the two remaining members of the team, Henry Robertson Bowers and Edward Wilson, continued their struggle to reach a supply depot just 11 miles away. However, overcome by exhaustion and the elements, they too eventually succumbed to the intact icy grasp. Scott's last diary entries, written as he lay dying in the tent surrounded by his deceased comrades, were poignant and introspective. 
He pondered the journey's failures and the decisions that led to his team's end. His words offer a hunting insight into the heart of a man who dared greatly in the face of overwhelming odds. As the story of these two expeditions is told, it becomes a narrative not just of a race to a geographical point, but of the human spirit tested against nature's most extreme conditions. It highlights the stark differences in leadership, preparation, and execution between Scott and Amundsen, providing enduring lessons on the importance of respecting and adapting to the environment one aims to conquer. This tale of ambition, tragedy, and survival serves as a powerful reminder of the costs and rewards of pushing human limits. It underscores the value of meticulous planning and the critical importance of choosing the right strategies and tools for challenging environments. In the end, the race to the shelf pole is a poignant chapter in the annals of exploration, a story of triumph and loss that continues to resonate with anyone who dares to venture into the unknown.